Hey guys, it's WSV3 founder and author Paul Maravilius of Windham, New Hampshire, here for you today with a narrated video demo of the current development progress with 6.0. And this is a new format. A lot of you mentioned that this would be a helpful thing for me to do. So I just want to say the software runs at 60 frames a second, but this stream might not reflect that. I don't have a fancy laptop. Uh, in fact, I've bragged about that a lot on the forums and elsewhere, how I don't develop on a gaming laptop. WSV3 is supposed to run beautifully and smoothly on consumer grade hardware. And that is something I'm never going to abandon. In fact, 6.0 is driven by an obsession over performance. And everything I'm about to show you in the current development update is intended to reflect the stark difference in quality and performance between the current release version 5.9 and what's coming with 6.0. 6.0 is the next generation of WSV3. Now what this video is not intended to be is for new users a complete and total update of 6.0 from the original con uh, conception of it, everything that's going to be different in 6.0. This is a little bit more uh, narrow to what I'm doing right now as of March 2023. But throughout this demo, I will, you know, I'll also talk about the general aspects of 6.0 where appropriate. But I just wanted to preface that this is not in any way comprehensive. This is certainly not a video for new users. If you don't know what WSV3 is, WSV3 is a piece of high-performance Windows PC weather graphic software for real-time weather data analysis and display on consumer-grade hardware. The idea behind WSV3, especially with 6.0, is to be able to put a tool in your hands that has the same level of quality, both in terms of the rendering and the analytical data scientific correctness, as something you would see on TV from your local news station, but something that doesn't run on a $50,000 hardware rack of NVIDIA Quadro cards. No, something that's going to run on your consumer Windows desktop or laptop PC. And... I currently believe WSV3 is slated to be, hands down, the number one most performant option in the market for that particular uh, goal. What I'd like to just briefly show you right here is the narrow 2023 development items. You're going to notice right here I have this color palette editor open. And this is something that is a long-standing user request. WSV3 6.0 will have and already has um, to a semi-level of completion here, a real-time color palette editor. You will be able to, let me let me take off some of the content on the map here just to make things simpler. I'm gonna take off the severe watches. Looks like we got some weather today out there in the Midwest. I'm gonna take off the cape as well. Uh, I'm even gonna take off the satellite. I'm just gonna go back to the basics here. Just radar, just national radar. So we've got a big you know, thunderstorm out here in uh, Missouri. So you're going to be able to use this color palette editor on the actual weather data layers in the program, like radar, like wind speed, like cape, like anything that you would load in a color fill in any layer in the program, whether it's model data or whatnot. And right now it's not tied up to do that. Right now it's only for um, the new rendering engine components, in particular the new text rendering engine, which you can see right here. And hopefully if you're familiar with 5.9, you can see how much more professional looking the font uh, engine looks both visually and the performance has skyrocketed as well in terms of lowering CPU usage consumption. Um, but this is a necessity. This color palette editor grew out of an originally as a 6.0 necessity for the new text rendering. Uh, in particular, the new text rendering engine is based upon a really state-of-the-art technique called sign distance field uh, rendering. And so those text objects, all the characters you see, this is all the new font rendering. Um, the old font engine is not currently displaying on the screen, even though I haven't totally ripped it out yet. It's based upon basically the distance between the edge of the character. And you store the character data as a numerical distance instead of as like pixels. And what you're able to do with this new rendering method is represent the color as a color palette, just like everything else, just like the weather data. The actual font is using something similar. And that's going to allow users to make custom styles for doing like stroke or outer shadow or glow and anti-aliasing in one render pass. But in order to do that, you need a way to create a color palette that's going to map the distance from the, from the edge of the character to a color. 
And so we're back to square one using the original WSV3 color palette editor system, which is terrible because you had to do it in a text editor. It's a text-based format. And so at that point with the new font engine, I came to a point where I said, okay, I got to make the default myself for the new graphical objects, right? In the new rendering engine. Am I going to sit there with the color palette editor and a text editor all day? And, you know, I wanted a visual tool just for my own artistic ability to do the art assets for 6.0. A lot of this is artistic and I haven't done the art part yet. You can see this is very basic. There's not even a background engine right now. This uh, development version, I'm getting it ready for the demo. There's no background engine. It's just using the new GIS engine, just doing basic like land and ocean polygons. But I needed myself a tool to quickly iterate color palettes. So I said to myself, you know what, we gotta go home. We gotta go bigger, go home here with 6.0. Let's do a dynamic color palette editor. So you can drag around the different color steps. Right now it's applied to the text frame backgrounds and the city, and the city labels. That's just one particular usage case. That's just for my own internal demonstration, just doing the rendering component there. But you can this, this gives you a flavor of what it's gonna look like when you can do it on actual data layers. So you can drag individual steps graphically here. And right now this is editing the sign distance field color palette for the background text frame. So that's why you see whenever I drag you know, this stuff over here, it changes the appearance of uh, the city labels. And I like this default I made right here. Um, there's a million ways you can style this. It gives you total and complete control. How about that outer shadow effect, right? You're going to see the power of sign distance field based rendering in 6.0. There's a couple of areas where it can be a thing. It's the thing for the font engine, even the contour lines right there. The contour lines aren't geometry. They're represented as a distance, but it actually does an edge detection algorithm. So I intend this to be useful for many areas of the program going forward, not just the uh, actual weather data color palettes like radar, but you know, for some of the actual graphical engines like text and whatnot. So I just want to also show you like dynamically changing the color here. So if I select this step, you know, this is the outer shadow effect thing I've got going on here. So if I make that really trans or uh, opaque and I make it, uh, I can make it a different color here graphically. You know, back in the day, or right now with the release version, you'd have to do all of this in a text editor. You'd have to spell out these RGBA values in a text editor, make sure you didn't make any syntax errors, then reload it, and you know, what a disaster that's been. Um, this is gonna allow users to customize everything that they want that uses color palettes in a much easier way. And so I, I think I've talked about this enough, but this is coming. Right now it's, it's obviously not finished. It doesn't support um, bilateral steps, you know, the steps, the color palette steps that have basically two different colors for interplating up and down. You know, that's common on uh, palettes like radar here where you have a hard edge between the yellow and the, uh, and the green. So, I, I, you know, I have to finish this. Um, but this is another huge addition that's coming to 6.0 that, like many other things in 6.0, just sort of grew out of something else that I was already doing. And, you know, one thing leads to another. Um, going back up that chain of, of causality, where did we get here? Why is there a new font engine? Well, there's a new font engine because I had to re-implement the city labels and the probe tool for 6.0. And I'd like to just show you how improved that is over 5.9 now that we're right here. So if I turn on some data, say I turn on the CAPE, and say I turn on the infrared satellite here. Um, the probe tool is now fully dynamic. Like I've said in the forums, you'll be able to drop points at certain places on the map and the numbers will animate with the timeline here. This is based on a very special technique I invented in late January. It's a GPU-based technique. So this doesn't use any extra CPU resources. It's practically free. The old way the probe tool was working in WSV3 was extremely inefficient. And it, you know, I could give a technical summary of it some other time, but um, it didn't enable having data points placed on the map that would update over time. And now you can do that in WSV3. And I'm actually showing that right here because the mouse rollover right now, I have it connected to just show the value at that point. And you can see that even though I'm moving the camera and even though that the map is playing animated data, those numerical values are updating in real time. So that's, that's showing you the feature right there. Just because I haven't hooked up the high level user interface ability yet to like drop points and stuff. Or even maybe I want to put it so that the city labels, right, this is a big feature request, will automatically have point probes attached to them. Um, you know, I haven't done that high level work yet, but the underlying rendering component to get the data back in CPU side, they are in a fast, efficient way, which was the major, you know, prevention of that previously. That is now working, as you can see.
And that method, that special method, also enabled the development of two very cool, very transformational, very useful things, both of which you're seeing. Number one, the real-time min-max detection, or the extrema labeling. I haven't decided yet what I want to you know, formally canonize it in terms of terminology. And the contour line labeling. These are two new features for 6.0 that grew out of this very high-performance shader-based method for getting uh, precise numerical point samples back um, to the CPU side where you can do logic on them. So basically, wherever you look now in WSV3, you're going to see the minimum and maximum value on screen for that time and for that view of any raster data layer. This is totally generic. It supports any raster data layer. So let me pause the map to the live frame, to the current frame. And you can see right now we have four labels in the map. These are automatically placed. We see 991 millibars. We see the value for the highest Cape value on screen. We see the lowest value for the infrared satellite because technically, even though it looks like a high value on the satellite, the unit there is uh, temperature in Kelvin. And it's actually the colder cloud tops that you see are the higher looking values. So that's actually technically the minimum, even though it looks like the maximum. And it looks like we've got some very strong reflectivity out here, 71.3 decibels. Uh, this is a worthy tangent for me to talk about for a couple minutes. This is revolutionary, in my opinion. No other weather program in existence, even the high-end broadcast systems from companies like uh, WSI, which is now bought out by IBM, um, in Andover, Massachusetts, a couple miles away from me. I'm in uh, southern New Hampshire, right in the greater Boston area. And systems sold by another company, uh, Barron, out of Huntsville, Alabama. They seem to have the monopoly on the TV uh, weather broadcasting software market, even those very fancy systems that run on very expensive hardware, they do not have this feature. Certainly nothing that's out there for Windows PC has this feature, uh, whereby you can dynamically change the view, and within that view, in real time, you will get a labeling of the min and max values. Um, not all the times are you going to see the minimum, so for instance, if it's a color palette, for radar, for instance, you really wouldn't want to see the minimum there. Uh, at least for the national radar, which doesn't encode negative reflectivities. Uh, same thing for like the satellite layer, where you don't really care where the maximum temperature would be. Um, some layers, though, you would want both the min and max, like pressure. So if I you know, zoom into a high pressure area uh, over here up in northern Canada, you're going to see the high value and you're going to see the low value. But what's very unique about this, I want to be clear, this isn't some CPU-based method where it pre-computes the min and max of the data set and then it puts a label on the map. No. This is view dependent. So this is done real time on the GPU. So wherever you zoom into within that view, constrained within that view, you will see the minimum and maximum. Uh, and it's also time aware. So if I, so if I hit play here, right, you're going to see those numbers update in real time. This is huge. This is so advancing towards the actual scientific and analytical usage case of the program. It used to be if you wanted to get a numerical understanding of the actual raster data sets that you're looking at, you would have to use that old ugly probe tool. You have to pause the map, keep it in one fixed view, and then roll over with your cursor and drop a point. And then as soon as you change the view or hit play, those numbers would go away. Now we have the real-time dynamic probability, but what is the most common case, right? Usually when you are analyzing one of these weather data sets and visualizing them, Really, you just want to get a sense of what's the highest and lowest value so you can make sense of the colors on the screen and the, the sort of relative distribution that they imply. But they don't imply absolute values, right? The colorization based upon color palette is very useful for connoting differences in values, but it doesn't really tell you the absolute values. So this automatic labeling feature that automatically puts the min and max on the map for a given data set, for a given view, and for a given timestamp, is tremendously helpful. And here's just a perfect example, right? There's a severe weather outbreak. Say we're zoomed out to the national scale here. All right, national scale. Right there, bam, on the map, I see that there's a 71.3 decibel thunderstorm somewhere in uh, Illinois, okay? And I automatically know if I want to have a certain area and I want to see the most extreme or the, the lowest or the highest value, I don't have to go fishing around in zooming places, right? I see a label there. I know exactly where that is. And I can say, okay, yeah, the strongest thunderstorm right now, at least measured by reflectivity, is right here in uh, Illinois. Um, it's using very sophisticated GPU graphics techniques to do this. Uh, maybe I shouldn't talk too much about it, but um, this one right here, I'll say that uh, DirectX 11 grade hardware has support for minimum and maximum texture sampling filters. 
and I'm actually making use of those. So if I'm zoomed out here at the national scale, it's going to read 71.3 decibels even though you know, if we were to take off all the text, and, and forgive me, the appearance, I know that the city labels are too big. This is not intended to look good right now. I'm just developing it. But, um, you know, the actual raster data being rendered might be less than that because you're sampling it, you're doing minification, right? And so you're band limiting the signal. Well, the implementation of the max and min labels here is really, really nice because it's using your intrinsic GPU ability to preserve the extrema, both in the minimum and maximum direction. So that's just a high level overview. I think that you've seen a lot of it in my previous and recent videos, and you're seeing a perfect demonstration of it actually live in action here during a severe weather event in the Midwest and how um, easy it becomes to go straight to where the action is to get a visual sense of where the strongest values are. Look, at it's actually very funny. You see that the uh, satellite extremum, the lowest cloud temperature in this current band 14 goes 16 uh, imagery product is right next to that thunderstorm here, uh, right next to it around Peoria, uh, Illinois. So it's, very, it's a very useful feature. And I, I just think it's beautiful to look at, too, because it really uh, gives a scientific sense of the underlying weather data that we're making look beautiful and pretty. But in the process of making it look beautiful, we don't want to lose the scientific precision. So WSV3 6.0 is fundamentally, from a broad point of view, a rejection of the idea that there's a dichotomy between a good-looking piece of weather graphics software and a scientifically competent and precise numerical display application. WSV3 wants to be your go-to tool for being both. Both a tool that will display to you very precise scientific meteorological data sets in their original projections with minimal to no sampling errors or, you know, cutting down the resolutions or saying, you know, what, it, what am I actually looking at? Like if you get these traditional weather um, model data plots, for instance, and two-dimensional static JPEG graphics from websites, right? What exactly are you looking at? You don't really know the correspondence between the original GRIB2 data set and the original, you know, values to what you're seeing on the screen. Okay, that's why programs like Gibson Ridge, for instance, the competitor, are so highly respected in the context of radar data, next red level to radar data. I fully admit Gibson Ridge GR2 analyst does outperform WSV3 in some certain areas. And I am on that for the 7.0 release line. We're doing a whole new rewrite of the level two. Um, but there's many, there's many areas, and I'd argue many more areas, where WSV3 is superior to Gibson Ridge. And I'm working every day very intensely to narrowing that gap, to listening to your feedback, and to make the product the best it can be. All right, moving on a little bit, because I talked a lot about the extrema labeling. Oh, yeah, the other uh, very novel technique here that was enabled by that underlying uh, method I invented for the probe tool in late January that opened the door to lots of other cool stuff is the real-time contour line labeling. Uh, that's again, totally unique. There's no other interactive GPU weather graphics program in the world that does this. The contour line rendering in WSV3, which itself I've massively improved the appearance of and rendering performance of for 6.0, is the only one that's available in any graphics display program for weather data that will put real-time animated labels on the respective contour lines. And I've also made these, con in, 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 in a situation where there's full temporal interpolation too. So you can see WSV3 has always had this, this beautiful temporal interpolation in the contour lines. That is based on a rendering technique I invented in, way back in, I think, summer 2014 now, um, which uses an edge detection filter. It's actually a dual-pass raster-based rendering technique. So these contour lines in WSV3, they look like lines, but they're not actual geometric points. Uh, GR Earth, for instance, um, you know, they, they have actual... They, you know, take the contour lines as vector data. And because of that, they just display to you staccato frames. Frame, frame, frame. There's no temporal interpolation like you see on the fancy television broadcast systems. WSV3 is pulling that off with real-time interactive frame rates on, on consumer graphics hardware. Uh, you know, a lot of this ugly, all these weird numbers over here, um, those are performance statistics that I developed just for my own profiling. And also, I want the users to be able to show me you know, how's it running on their PC? This whole second frame over here is GPU time. Uh, okay, on the left here, the bigger one is the CPU usage statistics. On the right is brand new. I'm, I'm actually collecting real-time GPU rendering time statistics. Uh, that helps me write very efficient software. I want to make sure that we're, we're within our frame budget. We've got to hit 60 frames a second. And that contour line rendering is taking, you know, well under half a millisecond, as you can see. Um, and it's doing this, this labeling algorithm. Yeah, back to the labeling algorithm. 
Um, it's putting numbers in the contour line so that you can get a very quick appreciation for the actual values. And uh, I made the contour layer here, the MSLP, compatible with the probe tool. So you can roll over and get the actual numerical readout. Uh, and then, of course, it also displays another perfect use case for that Extrema labeling feature. To be able to turn on the MSLP layer and have a number appear in these low and high pressure centers, it tells you exactly what you want to know. 99% of the time, you just want to know the values of those, you know, high and low areas. And keep in mind, this, this is going back to that feature, right? I just want to hammer this point home. It's per view. So say you had one low pressure center over here, right? Let me pause the map. Uh, but let's say there's another one. Okay, there's a deeper one up here. So the minimum here is 986.9 millibars. Well, if I have both on the screen at the same time, right? Um, you know, you're not going to see the value down here because that one's lower. Okay, so you just zoom in. You just zoom into that one. So the fact that it's constrained to your current view and it's being done on the GPU, which enables that, is so powerful. Because not only can you get the overall minimum and maximum value of a data set, but you can zoom in and get the min and max of certain subportions that happen to be on screen. So that's why that's super powerful. All right, going forward, I'd just like to comment on um, what else is happening with the new text rendering engine, which is sort of evolving in 6.0 into more of a generic point feature collection system. Also, um, you know, going back to the sprite rendering. If you see these NWS local storm report objects here, that's using the old sprite rendering engine. And uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's decent performance, but everything I'm working on here with the text and the city labels and re-implementing the probe, which required a new font rendering engine for many reasons that would be too technical for me to get into right now, that's having corollary effects in other places of the program that are so beneficial, okay? One of the areas that WSV3 is severely lacking, candidly and admittedly, and I've said this for a long time right now, is the METAR observations. Okay, they work, but they don't work great, and the performance is terrible. So with this new point rendering system, I'll be able to rewrite that layer, for instance, very quickly. Instead of a multi-month project, it'll be a week or two, maybe. And so this 6.0 update isn't just for 6.0. It's really for the entire 6x release line, where it's going to... Um, the new engine components are going to make it very easy for me to add more content and to uh, improve the stability and quality and performance of the existing data layers. So right now for the text engine, you know, you're going to be able to style the text, of course, um, using the color palette editor, but the background text frames, I want to be fully customizable. And not only customizable, but beautiful. You can see that these two-dimensional user interface overlays, like uh, if I roll over a point there, you can see I have a real-time dynamic UE blur effect. So it looks like, you know, like the Windows 10 blur. Uh, very efficiently implemented on GPU. I think that's beautiful. I think that um, combined with the new font engine, it adds a tremendous degree of visual clarity to the program and legibility. And I think that the legibility was severely lacking in the previous generation version 5.9 font engine. If you just compare the appearance of all of the text that's currently on the map to 5.9, 5.9 looks absolutely amateur. And so this was necessary not just because, it, you know, it's a graphical improvement. No. The graphical improvements are corollary. This is really about quality and performance improvements. And the lower CPU usage we can get away with means the more content we can add to the program. So I've had some ignorant comments on this very YouTube channel. And if you, know, if, if you have this misunderstanding, please comment below and I'll address it. But this isn't me making eye candy, okay, for WSV3. This is going straight to the core mission of delivering a quality and performant product that also does obviously look much more beautiful uh, like I said, this isn't an introduction to 6.0. I'm assuming you already know about the stuff I've been talking in the forums for months now. You can see that there's the new 3D camera system, and I have these amazing 3D Google Earth-like controls, and I can dynamically adjust the field of view. That's brand new. There's the new GIS engine, which you're seeing um, display real-time right now. I, in fact, have the entire local street data set for the entire Commonwealth of Massachusetts loaded right now. And this is showing off the new GIS engine. So, I mean, I've already posted videos um, going back to, you know, late 2022 describing those new aspects. I haven't even given that a coverage here um, in this short, hopefully it's gone on a little bit longer than I thought, uh, update video. But those are things that are coming with 6.0. Uh, the new GIS engine in particular was super necessary to re-implement the NWS advisories layer, which was very unique to WSV3, very ambitious layer, but 
um, you know, it sucks in, in 5.9. It's too resource consumptive. It's not precise. The old GIS engine I developed in summer 2017 couldn't really handle it. Uh, and now we have a proper quad tree based, highly efficient spatial hierarchical calling system and LOD system for the uh, shapefile data to render massive amounts of line and polygon data at very low resource consumption levels um, for 6.0. And you know, now that I'm doing this video update for the first time, it makes sense to at least give a couple minutes talking about that. So if you see, I have this extremely high resolution lake data shapefile loaded. And you can see I'm zooming in and out here from global scale to uh, local scale to, you know, Moosehead Lake in northern Maine uh, instantly with imperceptible transitions in LOD. This is a shapefile. I believe there's over 40,000 lake polygons in the shapefile. And WSV3 isn't even sweating. Uh, you can see that the frame time, the render time right here on the CPU side is about 3 milliseconds, 4 milliseconds. And the GPU render time is about 1 or 2 milliseconds. Our budget for reference is 16.67 milliseconds because that's the standard for... Uh, that's the gold standard for real-time interactive graphical frame rates if you're most often in the video game industry but also for scientific and medical applications that use the same um, infrastructure as video games but target that 60 frames per second interactive frame rate 60 frames a second translates to about 17 milliseconds so we have 17 milliseconds to do all of the processing and we're only using a fraction of that that's important for tactical reasons. WSV3 is a product that people use in different contexts. Some people plug it into their wall. They have a desktop plugged into the wall where power is no concern, and they broadcast with it on their you know, YouTube page or their weather page, their weather stream on Facebook or whatnot. But we have other users who put this in a car to go storm chasing, and they run it on their laptop. So there has to be very efficient and rugged programming here because there has to be low power consumption. If you want to decrease that frame rate, turn off the graphical effects and have something that's going to use minimal CPU and GPU to uh, make your battery last longer. So we really care about that. And I am at heart a, uh, I'm a very talented Win32 graphics programmer. So for me, performance is critical. WSV3 is not a high-level application. It's certainly not a web browser application. Uh, it's not even a C-sharp. You know, most of the stuff nowadays like this happens in C-sharp with .NET. It's not even that. It's a very low-level, high-performance, multi-threaded Windows 32 graphics application using Direct 3D 11. Um, and that makes it cutting edge. And it, that makes it able to do these very rich and informative weather data um, displays on consumer grade hardware. You don't need to buy a gaming laptop even. Even a consumer gaming laptop you don't need. I develop on a business laptop, this current PC. Uh, granted, I did take the resolution down to 1280 by 720 just because I'm running the streaming here. But this is actually using um, Intel embedded graphics. This doesn't even have a separate dedicated graphics card like an NVIDIA or AMD card like you'd have on a gaming laptop. So I've just been, as I'm talking here, I've been going through the different layers of the program. You notice there's no background engine right now, so it doesn't look as nice. But this is just to show you the performance and stability of the product, some of the new rendering engine components, and my current work. Uh, and my current work with that real-time color palette editor and finishing up the text display engine for 6.0, which is just such a massive improvement. So thank you again for your attention uh, and for your patience. I've been working on this transformative and revolutionary 6.0 update now really since October 2022 and it's going to be many more months. I have a lot of things that are necessary left to do. I have to finish the GIS engine so that you can import your own shapefiles. I have to re-implement the roadside labeling at a very minimum the manual street labeling. I have to make the whole new NWS advisories layer. That's a huge task. There's a lot of work left to do here but uh, I'm going to get out a demo probably around a month from now so that you'll be able to play with the current progress. Um, really, I don't expect it to be much more than that. Really, it's still too early to do a beta. But uh, I am trying to work on this. I'm working very intensely on this because I'm committed to the WSV3 user community, in particular the people who have been with me since December 13th, 2015. The release day of WSV3, which was now you know, coming up in 2023, later this year, WSV3 will be eight years old. It's currently seven years old. And every single year since the release, I have made good on my progress, on my promise to progress this product forward, to add valuable features that are driven by user feedback 
and to obsess over the experience from a performance and quality point of view. And I am not satisfied with 5.9 in many ways. And my lack of satisfaction in some of the underlying engine components and the graphical performance aspects of 5.9 made this major step necessary. So I need your patience. I need your patience with 6.0 because it needs to be everything that it can be. And I need to perfect and polish it. Thankfully, with the idea of doing the demo, though, there's really not much of a huge trade-off between perfecting and keeping you waiting. Uh, keeping you waiting, that's going to go away pretty soon because you'll be able to install that 6.0 demo side by side with 5.9. And I'm going to make that. I'm going to make that a thing. I'm going to make it use a separate app data folder, a separate executable name. Uh, I want you to be able to sort of use the unfinished progress parallel with the release pro uh, with the release version for a couple months because it's going to take me a couple months to finalize 6.0 uh, according to your valuable user feedback. Finally, I'd like to reiterate my request that you stay in touch with me about your feedback, about your user experience. Anything in 5.9 that's not working for you very well, I probably have already heard about it, but let me know. Let me know what your ideas are. If there's anything that you think that could be in 6.0, that's uh, related to the things that I've shown you that I'm working on without too much extra work, let me know. In particular, the re-implementation of the probe tool with the city labels. Um, you know, let me work that. I've got to finish the, the new text rendering engine first, and I'm going to deck out all of the customization options there. Uh, I've made a lot of progress on that. The performance increase is astounding, right? Just like, for instance, the city labels using the new font engine. That's one draw call to draw all of the city labels. The old crappy 5.9 and older font engine that I wrote, I think that's from early 2017, uh, couldn't handle that. You had to do a separate draw call for each point in the map. Terrible efficiency and terrible appearance. So we're making major strides here. And my goal is for WSV3 to serve you as the leading Windows PC weather graphics application for real-time tracking purposes. And also, if there's some forecast model data, the model, the model data engine in WSV3 is great nowadays. Uh, actually, in my opinion, that's one of the strong areas. I personally use WSV3 for the model data uh, very often, uh, but the focus will always be the real-time weather tracking, radar, satellite, uh, observation, stuff like that. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, let me know in the comments below if you thought this format was helpful. I really want you to comment on this video, whether it's positive or negative. It's, if it's negative, write your comment and I'll respond. But if it's negative, don't accuse me of not addressing bugs and issues, but just making new eye candy, right? No, that's not a fair criticism. I've had some people in the comments, right? Everything I'm working on in 6.0 might have the side effect of making it more beautiful. Yes, it does. Some things have been squarely towards that, like the 3D cameras. But I'm rewriting these underlying graphical rendering engine components that allow me, A, to deliver more content to you that you might find useful for analytical meteorological purposes, and B, to increase the performance. So even if I'm not adding a single new feature, which I am, but if I was just decreasing the CPU and GPU usage of the program with the new rendering engine, that is absolutely towards the goal of making a higher quality product that can be used for scientific analytical purposes going forward. WSV3 is best known and differentiated, however, by its customization and graphical abilities. So I do have to maintain uh, the loyalty to that. Like I said, I want to serve you with a product that's both beautiful and scientifically rigorous, analytical, and informative. Thank you very much, and stay tuned to this channel and to the WSV3 forums for further information and news as we get closer to the 6.0 update. And as always, please be welcome to email me at paul at paulmarv.com if I can answer any questions or solicit any of your very valuable user feedback. Thank you.